Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on financial wellness. It's your ultimate employee engagement tool, brought to you in advance of Talk Money Week, which starts on the 9th of November. And it's brought to you with the expert help of WageStream. Thank you. And one of our, these are one of our uh, UK financial wellbeing investment matching partners. And with us from WageStream also is wellbeing director Rob Geary. We're delighted to welcome two guest speakers. First, Eric Porter, founder and CEO of Cheddar. Eric is a financial wellbeing consultant and coach, and he's also a member of the Financial Services Consumer Panel. Eric will be taking us through the criteria for a financial wellbeing strategy and proof that addressing this area really does help. We're also really pleased to be joined by Katie Duxbury, She's the head of payroll services at Bupa, and Katie will be looking at how Bupa identified their own well, uh, financial well-being need, how they addressed it, and how the measures they put in place are helping deliver results. This is such a pertinent topic right now. It always has been, but the difference now is that the COVID pandemic has helped ensure a concerted focus by businesses on the basic needs of its employees. Lots of people right now are feeling financial pressure, and that's at all salary levels. In fact, research finds that half of employees say money worries are a distraction at work, and that's according to uh, The Great Recovery, a report by WageStream. Uh, in this 40-minute or so webinar, we'll help you with practical and cost-effective tips on setting up a financial well-being program some best, best practice examples and evidence that financial well-being helps lower stress, reduce turnover and improve engagement. So now over to Eric Porter from Cheddar. Thank you, Tracy. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for taking some time out of your day to join us. So as Tracy mentioned, you know, money worries are, are now probably higher than ever. And we know um, that they're affecting people differently, right? So it's affecting people, you know, that maybe have had a reduction in income or lost a job, but it's also impacting people somewhat positively in that, you know, the results of lockdown and restrictions on movement have allowed people to save a little bit more. So um, very different solutions for very different um, types of people and the impact that they felt. So. A couple of stats for you on the screen. I'm not going to go through them all, but you know, there, there's also this danger of falling into debt between pay cycles. Now, that's something that absolutely existed prior to um, to COVID, and probably now has been exacerbated by by what we've seen. We also know that a lack of financial education across the UK is a problem. Most of us came out of a school system that probably didn't equip us very well for dealing in the financial world. Um, that was true pre-COVID, it's very true now. Um, and while there have been great efforts put in place to, to try and start educating young people, it's actually going to continue being a problem, especially now with the impacts of COVID, because guess what? Schools don't have time to concentrate on financial education. They're trying to just run normal lessons and everything else. So um, it often falls to, as many of you know, to employers and the private sector to close that gap when it comes to financial education. Um, so we'll talk today around how financial education as part of your strategy um, can help. When we talk about financial wellness, um, there are four areas of financial wellness. And now financial wellness, financial well-being, whatever you want to call it, um, are words that are banded around quite frequently now in the financial sector. And sometimes it's truly about a program to help people. And it's around you know, helping people feel happy and more content with their money. Um, unfortunately, sometimes financial well-being is also used to describe things like uh, debt, and credit products and other things. So um, it's really important that we, you know, when we talk about financial wellness, financial well-being, that we, we look to the definition of, of any of the partners that you might be engaging with. When we talk about it at WageStream and also with Ch within Cheddar, we're talking around you know, feeling in control, being in control of your money. And that's probably the one where most people spend their time when we think about you know, which banking apps do you want to use or, you know, knowing that you have a budget and the ability to, to know how much money you've got coming in and going out. 
Um, and it's where the financial press is probably the most active um, and places like Money Saving Expert or Martin Lewis or anyone else that you might see on TV or in the media, they're often talking about that feeling and control element. The next one, which is very relevant to us right now, is that capacity to absorb a financial shock. Well, if we didn't know what a financial shock felt like before, I think we can all agree we do now. And a couple of things about what we're experiencing now. One, yes, we have now a financial shock, which gives us all the ability to think about, well, you know, how is it impacting me? How will it impact me in the future? But the other opportunity and why, and why it's such a good reason to talk about financial wellness now is there's often a lot of shame associated with money and the, the ability to absorb a financial shock. Well, actually, this is one opportunity when maybe we don't need to feel as ashamed because nobody could have predicted this. We're all in this um, very weird time and trying to work through um, all of our financial issues. So it's a really great time to get everyone in and, and start talking about money, which is exactly what Talk Money Week, as Tracy mentioned for next week, is trying to do. It's being on track to meet financial goals, whatever those goals are, short term, long term, and then also having the flexibility to make choices, right? And that again, can be choices for today, that can be choices for the future when it comes to retirement and everything in between. So we're going to talk about some top tips for setting up your financial well-being program. Now, um, employers have been grappling with this for you know, a few years now, and it's true. It's it's right to say that you know we don't necessarily have um, you know a silver bullet. There has to be a lot of aspects to this, and. We're going to do a quick poll just before we get started. You know, do you have a financial well-being in your in your organization? You could just to see um, what you might already be doing before we get into the tips. And Georgie's opened up the poll, so please feel free to participate on your screen. Looks like we've got some results coming in. We've got about forty-nine percent of people are saying no, not really, um, and everyone else is split between sort of and yes, loosely. Okay, great. So thanks for participating in that. Um, so yes, if, if you've already got one, then some of these tips could be just a good refresher for you, or maybe you, you're able to say, oh, my plan or my program already touches three or four of those, but not all. If you don't have one, this would be a really good opportunity for you to think about what that um, program might look like. So let's jump into the tips. So the first thing is, whatever you do, it has to be available to everyone. And I think this is so, so important. You can see a couple of stats of, you know, people feeling excluded and having inclusive programs on, on the screen. Um, I often engage with people in companies who, who ring me up and say, oh, we're interested in doing something, but you know, oh, it's only for the young people because they're terrible with money. Um, but you know, everybody who's over age 45 is fine, they don't need it. Or, oh, we only need to talk to the people who are 55 plus because they're about to go into retirement. The rest of them, they've got time, doesn't matter. And I think that's a really a dangerous place to start when we think about assumptions that we make about the people that we work with, our colleagues or, or people in our organization. Um, we really want to make sure that we've got something that's available for everyone because there's also an opportunity to not only educate people on finance and to feel better about their money, but there's also a really good opportunity here to promote equality and diversity. You want people to feel comfortable coming in, talking about money, no matter what their income, no matter what their socioeconomic background. Um, so you, you can get a couple of wins as an organization here when it comes to equality, diversity, and then you know, obviously financial well-being. So making it available to 100% of people. The next thing is it has to be available when they need it. There's absolutely no point in talking about getting out of debt to a whole bunch of people who don't even have a credit product and have never been in debt or have any um, access to, to credit, right? By the same token, you know, while it's important to talk about pensions very early, um, how we talk about pensions has to be very different when we're talking to you know, someone who's just entered the job market as opposed to someone who's five years away from retirement. Their needs are different. So making sure that it's available at the right moment is, is key. And, and I guess that that challenge that that presents then, of course, is it means that you can't just have one channel, right? You can't just say, oh, well, we offer one workshop a year and that's fine. Or, oh, we've got this website that has two or three things on it about various topics. Um, you have to do all of those things. It's kind of like any marketing strategy. You have to have information available across 
many channels for many different um, types of people. And we all work in very diverse workplaces. And so that's really, really important that we also don't make assumptions around when people might need it. Some of those old school assumptions where we would used to think about, you know, oh, well, people who are 27 are going to be in the housing market and they're thinking about getting their first home. Well, we need to think about life stages. That is true. You know, so people who might be you know, trying to get a home or maybe starting a family. But we can't make assumptions now about when that happens in terms of age, because we know that those um, demographics are shifting all of the time. So right moment. And, and for the right group of people. So getting a positive outcome at, at the end. The next step is it needs to really include some independent financial guidance. And this is what we hear over and over from employees. Um, they trust you as an employer to get information, to help organize access to information, but they absolutely are interested in independent financial guidance. Um, so that you know they're not being forced to take a specific product or um, or me feeling like they're being forced to take a specific product, but really being educated and informed about the decisions that they can make and the information that they need. Um, so working with a partner or partners, as you know, we're evidencing today, can make your strategy really, really powerful. Um, and making sure that you know while you are utilizing the trust that your employees have in you as an employer, um, that you don't overstep that bound, and that you are able to hand them off to to the right partner at the right time. The next thing is really trying not to increase employee debt in any form, right? So when we think about the wage stream tool, um, you know, giving you access to your money, um, you know, earlier than, you, than your payday, um, and that's giving you access to money that you've already earned as opposed to taking out a loan or increasing your debt. So you know, sometimes it is absolutely appropriate that an employee might need to take a loan or access some type of credit. But again, it's about equipping them to make those decisions on their own and not necessarily pushing that to them um, as part of the, the offering. So we really want people to feel empowered to make those decisions. We also don't want people to be feeling like they've been kind of roped into taking a loan through their employer um, and then maybe kind of feeling either forced, pressured, or maybe even held hostage. If we go back to the days where people who work for banks, for instance, used to get um, mortgages, not really allowed now because of tax law, but they got mortgages or got better um, terms. Um, sometimes employees felt a little bit held hostage, like they couldn't move employers at some point because of that. And, and we really don't want that type of a workforce, not really great for motivation. And finally, it needs to promote good savings habits. Whatever we're doing, it has to promote good savings. And we know that when it comes to financial resilience and people feeling confident and resilient, that savings, no matter what study you read, that it is savings that drives that level of resilience and the feeling of resilience. So whatever you're doing, something in there has to be about savings, whether that's through pension savings, whether that's through some of the savings tools that you might get with WageStream or other providers, savings is, is really, really key as part of that. All of that is really around reducing financial stress. And we know that financial stress is, is constant. We know that it's probably increasing today in the workplace. Um, you know, financial and money challenges, 46% of people saying that, you know, that that's what's causing them stress. Health concerns probably increasing. So um, another poll for you now, it'd be great to just see, you know, are you aware of the financial stress that's affecting people in your workplace? So if you'd like to just take a minute and vote in our poll. Just get a sense of if you know what's going on in terms of financial stress. Georgie, what's the poll telling us? Um, it looks like we've got a bit of a split verdict, but most people, 47% of people are saying yes, definitely, which is good to see. Okay, great. So that means you're aware of what's going on and you know that it's a, a potential problem in your workplace. And then probably the reason that most of you are here is, well, what are we going to do about it, right? So just a few more stats on financial stress. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we know that financial stress causes people to miss time out of work, right? So two and a half days per employee per year on average. Um, we know that, you know, the, the time off of salary, or sorry, uh, the productivity, 25 to 34 days of productivity is lost, um, averaging around 13 to 17% of salary costs, as you see there. And people are taking time off work. And that's not to mention, you know, of course, now, slightly different, but 
the days when we were in the office and, you know, occasionally your colleague would be nipping into a conference room to take a personal call that might have been from a debt collector or could have been, you know, a, a problem within the family and, you know, the, their sister was calling them to say, oh, I need money again or whatever it is. Um, so we know those kind of conversations do happen in the workplace. They're distracting people from their work. Um, they're probably stressing them out um, and maybe then impacting the, their ability to perform well for you. Um, so there, there's definitely a case for managing financial stress in the workplace. Now, the one thing that we often talk about is we know that there's a case for it, but how do I evidence it, right? So how can I prove, which is often so tough with well-being programs, the return on investment? You know, why am I going to tackle this? Times are tough. Budgets are really tight. Most of you are probably busy doing 700 other things right now other than thinking about your well-being strategy. Um, and so I'm going to just give you, <clears throat> excuse me, an example of what we do within Cheddar and how we address some of these. So we have um, actually five elements of financial well-being. So there's one, addition, one additional one to what you've seen from uh, the, the wage stream team. Our additional one is called clarity and security. And so we use that to talk to people around wills and, and future planning and health decisions and those types of things. But within those five elements, so financial objectives, control of daily finances, financial shocks, and then financial options, in addition to clarity and security, we have a series of workshops that we offer. Now, workshops are great. You know, they give people that kind of nudge to start getting them talking about their money, thinking about their money, maybe for the first time. They may not have ever had it. Again, as I said before, great opportunity to get people in and thinking uh, across um, income bands, seniority bands, you know, taking that equality opportunity. But the really key thing is we do two different things in addition to just the workshops. The first one is a workplace financial stress assessment. So being able to go in and through a survey, ask, um, employees, you know, how they're thinking and feeling about money today, and then using that information, which is anonymized and played back to the employer and to the employees to craft a strategy that works. And that's not just workshops, but that's other products and services that might be available, um, you know, content for intranet sites or well-being hubs that might exist within a business. Um, so we author that, we work through all of that. Um, but also helping businesses demonstrate the ROI. So the, the financial stress assessment can really help with that so that you start to get a sense of, you know, if people are in debt, by how much? If people are taking time off of work, you know, how much are they taking off of work? So that will really help you figure out, are you one of those employers that's losing two and a half days per employee per year, or are you losing five, or maybe you're losing less? And then once we've got that information and really important, employees are reluctant to answer those questions when the data is going back directly to the employer. So the information is coming straight to us at Cheddar. We're processing that information, deleting it because we're not entitled to hold it um, and, and we don't want to hold it. And then we play that back, as I said, anonymously to the employer. And then we may choose from a number of the workshops here. So you see things like an introduction to financial well-being. So that can be a really good diagnostic tool um, for an organization that's maybe never done anything in that space. We then might talk about understanding pay and tax, which is good for everyone, but could especially be good for people who, um, who are new to the workforce. The real, the, probably our number one workshop at the moment, financial well-being and challenging times. And we kind of shift that one around whatever's happening in the world. So today, no surprise, we're talking a lot about navigating government programs, understanding what happens in redundancy and those types of things. And then, of course, on the left hand side of the screen, you see you know, all of the different ones that have a more of a product focus and financial options um, you know, that, that are kind of constants in people's lives. So um, a, a really comprehensive set of things uh, and topics that we cover. But again, all based on that financial stress assessment and then you know, having feedback and insights for the employer and for the employees. So thanks for uh, taking some time to listen to me this morning. And I'm going to hand back to Georgia. Super, Eric, thank you so much. It's great to have um, a few important criteria or steps um, to look at and consider if you're um, implementing that sort of strategy. And great to see the Cheddar workshops. I know we've um, done a few at Wagestream because we like to um, keep an ear to the ground. And likewise, we work um, with all of our clients um, with, um, with Cheddar doing some financial wellness workshops. So you've got the link there from Eric, but if you obviously want to find out any more, anything else, do let us know. We can marry you up. They're great sessions. Um, but now without further ado, it's, it's Katie's turn and we're so pleased to have her. Katie, thank you so much for joining us. You're going to be doing a bit of a case study um, and showcasing what, what Beep have been doing. So Katie, over to you and thank you for joining us.
Thanks, Georgie. Good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to complement Eric's insights with an overview of the value of getting the right financial wellness package from an employer perspective, um, reflecting our, own, our implementation of pay on demand at Bupa Care Services. Um, so as I'm sure you would imagine, Bupa in general has, you know, quite a, a, a rich reward package and, and all the whistles and bells that you would you would expect. Um, we do experience some challenges, particularly in the care sector. And this story, all told, is probably around about four years in the making of us addressing uh, whether we're actually hitting the mark for our employees. And just by way of, of background and context, I'm sure you're aware the UK has got a chronic shortage of nursing and caring resources. Um, and the care sector, aged care sector, is probably the least glamorous angle of, of a, a care career. Um, so that's the, you know, the backdrop that we're operating in and getting the reward package right is so key for us meeting that ongoing challenge. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, we have got a very rich reward package, but when you look at that through the lens of care services, it starts to lose some of its relevance. Um, you know, if we've got packages around to saving um, salary sacrifice type schemes where people are saving for pensions or buying bikes or computers or buying up annual leave. And that's great if somebody has got the NI to save, but if that isn't your spending priority, clearly that loses all its relevance in this sector. The timeliness of our compensation as well was something that was, was a challenge by virtue of the fact that we compensate these, um, these staff groups on the back of timesheets. It meant that we were always paying in arrears pretty much, um, which made it very difficult to plan. We pay in full weeks, which often means that we are paying a four week, four week, five week pattern, paying at the end of the month. So every third month was slightly lumpier than the previous two payments. And again, that made financial planning very difficult. And what we also experience is that a home manager would have an immediate requirement for some resource to make sure our care ratios were, um, were good. If somebody had called in sick, you know, an immediate need to fill a shift. But an individual volunteering to fill that shift wasn't going to get that compensation potentially for up to six weeks by the time it had filtered through payroll cutoffs and actually landed in their pay slip. So the timeliness was a real challenge for us. What was therefore a challenge because of these, these aspects and the competitiveness of, of the resource in this sector was making sure we were aligning with business objectives. Our key objective as a business is to provide fantastic quality care for our residents. And the best way of doing that is reducing the number of people that have contact with those residents. And if we're having to deploy agency resources or bank resources, that doesn't put the same familiar face in front of our residents. It doesn't create those heartfelt relationships and influence our clinical outcomes in a positive way. So any initiative that helps us reduce the number of people that come into our homes is really key, especially where we've got dementia units for sure. And especially right now, actually, where um, infection control is, is really key and reducing the number of people that are, that are in and out of our care homes and dealing with our residents. And also, you know, importantly from a business perspective, fiscally we want to reduce our agency spend. It's very expensive to deploy agency and much cheaper as a business in, in an already squeezed margin to get our existing employees to do those shifts. So, how did we try and address this? So what we did um, initially was we created partnerships with Neighbour and Leeds Credit Union that provided our employees with access to debt consolidation, um, access to preferential um, loans, and also saving products through the, through the credit union, which is, you know, enabled by the employer, but a little bit clunky. You know, it's not streamlined. There's application processes and work to do to access those benefits. We improved our emergency loan process. We removed some of the administrative friction from that, but it's still, because it was a, a business sponsored scheme, it still involved the individual going and asking the, the home manager for that financial support and that loan from Bupa, um, which is, as Eric mentioned earlier, that shame and guilt around not quite being on top of your finances, we felt was prohibitive to employees and they weren't accessing that when they really needed it. A longer term plan that we had was to invest in having one time and attendance system across the estate. I think at the time we embarked 
on this project, we had six time and attendance systems that were, um, you know, wired in, in a variety of ways, um, tech enabled for the employee in a variety of ways and just not a great, a great experience for the employee and the administration. So we harmonized onto one time and attendance system. What that also did for us was it opened the door for us to be able to mirror um, or research mirroring the NHS labor model where they have a monthly payroll for um, permanent employees and a weekly paid um, bank portfolio and those two work in combination to provide um, safe care ratios. And we were looking at that point to, to mirror that, that experience with, with the NHS. But that in itself created barriers. It's logistically very difficult to deliver that kind of, of model. Um, it creates all sorts of complexity around national insurance and pension treatment and the appropriate tax um, treatment for the individual. And we were also conscious that there wasn't a one size fits all. You know, we had people that were paid monthly and were quite happy being paid monthly alongside somebody who desperately needed access to cash and cash injections outside of that monthly pay cycle. It also meant that we were layering administrative burden um, into the homes, which is not the direction of travel that we wanted to support. So while we were looking at ways to solve this problem, we were really struggling with, with plan A hitting, hitting the mark. And at that point, around that time, the concept of pay and demand really started to gain some traction and some, uh, some coverage as a concept within reward and payroll circles. So we decided to just pivot our resources and our energy into researching what that would look like alongside looking at replicating the NHS model. So there were still a few barriers to us being able to implement that. Um, we had to get over some initial um, uh, stereotypes, I suppose, from, from our senior executive sponsors around this kind of vehicle. Um, there was some real discomfort around whether we were just tech enabling people to get into debt quicker. And that clearly wasn't, you know, what, what something that we wanted to facilitate. Um, so our approach was always going to be very prudent and very much designed around safeguarding that, that eventuality. Um, the technology was pretty new to market and, you know, Boop is a long established uh, company. We don't necessarily like being trailblazers. We like using tried and tested models. And because this concept was fairly new, the data points um, available to create a, bit, a business case needed a little bit of imagination and a little bit of contextualization to our sector to really understand what that cost benefit forecast would be and get that internal buy in. Um, once we've gotten over those uh, main hurdles, the introduction of the technology um, in proportion was relatively straightforward. It was um, massively enabled by the time and attendance system that was in situ by this point. And, you know, getting, getting two systems to talk to each other rather than getting six TNAs to talk to the wage stream product made that implementation really straightforward and, and relatively easy. What we'd also achieved through rolling out our time and attendance system is that it was mobile deployed. So we'd already established a portfolio of employees that were using their mobile phones to um, connect and engage with us as a company, you know, to, to book holidays or look at what shifts were available. And the Waystream application was, you know, had, had really safe entry into, into that, that same space of people looking at things on their mobile phones that connected to work. So what does success look like for us? So we implemented um, WageStream in our care services sector in November 2019. We realised our financial ROA within the first um, quarter, which is which is fantastic. It was, you know, it landed um, it landed into open arms. Ultimately, the take up really from the get go was significant. There was no build up as we've experienced in other benefit rollouts. So that was was very welcomed. And we knew from very early of the launch that we were, you know, we were in the in the right place with this. We surveyed um, users within a month of having the system launched and we got around about 600 replies and we noted reduction in financial stress. Um, a reduction in being distracted at work, which again for us is, is massively key when people are administering medication or giving one-to-one -one care. We also noted a reduction in the use of payday loans or reduction in using overdraft facilities, which again is exactly the, um, the, you know, the, the positive effect that we were trying to create. 
we had um we we had users from across the estate so we currently have so we give you where we're up to currently with 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 users just under half of our employees have enrolled and have the application in their pocket of those um enrollees half of them are using the product to stream so it's they're not insignificant sign ups the people that aren't using the application to stream finances are just using the application to know that they've got that emergency buffer if they were to need it. You know, a lot of this, um, the, the financial well-being and financial health space in our experience is not just about, you know, money changing hands. It is very often about just providing that safety net and that comfort that you are insulated against any, um, you know, emergency situations and, and financial shocks. So that's really great to see that there's a benefit, even if people aren't using the stream facility. We have case studies from across the estate. So they're, they're, all our homes and villages are participating. So again, it's, you know, it's across the UK, it's across the earnings groups, it's across our roles. Um, you know, there's, there's no like one pocket of people that we're servicing and other people are, are not using it is, it is across the piece. And we have case studies from either end of, of, of the experiences. So we have a mother of four who is using the app to manage her bills and her outgoings and not resorting to predatory lenders, which, which she has had to do in the past, compared to a young man who is still living at home, probably leaning into the bank of mum and dad a little bit more than he should be and is using the application to create his own financial independence. So, you know, we, we are talking about something that really does cut across the demographics, which is fantastic. Since our launch in November last year, we have continuously improved the application. We have created um, a segmentation of additional and uh, non-contractual shifts, and this has been a real game changer. So just harking back to the situation where managers were struggling to get employees to take a shift on the last minute, or, you know, can you stay later for a couple of hours, or can you do a shift for me tomorrow? That has, that has really turned around. It's, it's, it's been a complete game changer for us because somebody can pick up a shift tomorrow that they weren't planning on doing and then spend that money the day after. And in that kind of scenario, it's unexpected additional compensation and they're not even touching their monthly bills money that they will get at the end of the month through the payroll. So that has really created this situation where we have employees that have got that monthly regular income that they are putting to one side. And rather than then getting a second job and being on somebody else's bank for that weekly cash injection, they're creating that through the application, which is exactly the scenario we were trying to create. Um, what has also um, improved with the application is this concept of safe stream, where individuals can put a tiny amount of their earnings into a, um, into a little savings cushion within the application. And we have around about 800 people using that at the moment and reporting some of them reporting that this is the first time they've ever had any savings on one side. Again, creating that philosophical um, safety net underneath somebody's um, financial wellness. So it's all it's all good news from our perspective. So I'll leave you with um, some sound bites from uh, some of our customers um, and some, some context around why people are using the app and what they're using it for. And just um, can almost hot off the press actually, we have um, just reached five million pounds worth of streams since we launched in care services. So that's around about 11 months worth um, of, of streams totaling five million pounds worth of money into people's hands when they need it for the re, you know for all the right reasons um, and putting them more in control of their financial health. We have um, a, a few more rollouts planned. We rolled out to our dental portfolio this month. Um, sorry, last month we're in November now, aren't we? So we're in October. We rolled out to our dental arm. We are looking forward to rolling out to our insurance and health clinics portfolio this month. Um, and looking forward to the same rave reviews from, from that portfolio. Um, so hopefully that has helped. I do appreciate that it's a little bit of a whistle stop tour, um, but really getting you know, that sweet spot between us making our business objectives um, whilst ensuring that our employees have got that financial wellness has been a real game changer for us in this sector. Thanks, Georgie. 
Lovely, Katie, thank you so much. It's so lovely to see, um, you know, Bupa really understood how important it was to look after that sort of financial wellness element of their colleagues and having launched, you know, in the run up to Christmas last year, it really meant your colleagues could access their pay. And it's great to see some of those stories coming through of people being able to have the type of Christmas that they wanted because, you know, you gave them that flexibility. Um, so um, thank you so much. It's been an absolute honour to have you today and uh, for all of your time. Um, I know you're extremely busy at the moment, so thank you. Um, we love having you as part of our WageStream family. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Rob um, from WageStream to talk a little bit about the platform and how that drives employee engagement. So Rob. Yeah, thanks, Katie. That was that was absolutely brilliant. You probably summed up Waste in a much better way than I ever could. So I'll do. I will try though. Try and surmise that and follow that. I suppose. Uh, so look, firstly, I just wanted to give you, as I say, a couple of minutes on what we actually do. Uh, just give you a bit of insight into the financial resilience tools that we actually have available, obviously for all of our partners and obviously future partners that we work with. So look, Waste is an app. It's basically it's fundamentally an app product that allows practical ways that people can both track access, save, as Katie mentioned, um, part of their earnings. It's, it's designed with full flexibility in mind to give people the opportunity to have fair access and access whenever they need it. Again, touching on what Eric mentioned earlier. Now, underpinning all of this is the financial education that we build within the app as well, which is delivered in a bite-sized modular sort of way and is 100% independent. And that is designed to give skills to people that may have never had the opportunity in the past or may have not actually spent any time or really have the platforms to go out and find that information. So we want to keep it in a very simple ecosystem that they can use. Now, we also understand that really to offer real value, we have to provide value back to the organizations we work with as well. So sitting behind and underpinning all that is a HR analytics platform uh, that provides reporting and, and, and tools back to organizations to really understand the well-being of their employees and of their colleagues within those organizations in real time. So this is something that obviously is pretty much game changing in a lot of ways because it really helps organizations shape what they should be doing moving forward um, in, in terms of providing well-being as a whole piece. Now sitting like at the heart of what we do is our social mission. This really underpins everything we do. Uh, we're lucky enough to work with some of the leading uh, charities in this space, including the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, Barrow Cadbury Trust, um, and really the, the point of this is, is, is designing resilience products and services that can give tangible help to individuals. Now, with their guidance and with, with our mission, and that's always been at the heart that we'll only ever build ethical financial technology, it's helped us to amass over 350,000 users uh, across some brilliant sectors. Obviously, we've already heard by Carney from Katie in the healthcare space. We obviously work alongside Bupa. In the retail space, we work alongside of Holland and Barrett, the hospitality space, Green King. We are lucky enough to partner with 10 NHS uh, trusts at the moment as well. It's an area that we've become very strong in because ultimately it supports organizations on a day-to-day -day basis and more importantly, the users that sit within them. Now, any, anything that is ever brought into an organization needs to show impact. And that is one thing we've definitely managed to do. The main areas we actually impact within organizations is increasing the productivity that people see, like reducing the absenteeism and also the retention of people that work within those organizations. And one thing I definitely encourage anyone to do on the call is go onto our website and download the Ipsos Mario report, which is, is very topical right now as an organization. As you know, they do a lot of studies, obviously, for the government. Um, they basically proved that less people will leave an organization as a direct result of, of implementing waste within your business. So the impact is huge from a business perspective, but for me personally, the impact and the engagement we see in terms of the colleague and employee engagement is just absolutely crazy. It's something that we're hugely proud of and spent a lot of time working towards and will continue to develop as a business as well. But as I say, one word that really sums us up is engagement, like collectively against all of our brilliant partners, we see a 54% adoption rate, which is just absolutely staggering. And more importantly than that, rather than people just downloading the app, the way they practically use it is also mind boggling. Like the average person will use the wage stream track function to really understand what it is they've earned to that point in time, 21 times, which really helps them budget better and understand their finances better. The average person reads six articles a month, which is all independent, which is giving them the right information. So we receive that information from um, the money and pension service, again, on an independent basis. 
And also the way our people actually use our stream function, and Katie will back this up based on her experience of obviously the 12 or so thousand Booper colleagues that obviously have access. The average person access is 70 pounds when they ever make a stream. So they're using this for those pinch point problems. And that's what we really address. And that's how people see this as such an important tool. And it's something we're hugely proud of and will continue to develop. I, I just want to tie back slightly now to what Eric mentioned before in terms of the criteria. Like we are totally aligned with how he looks at the wellbeing piece. He is an expert in this space. Um, and how we run an all and have products available will always fit this criteria that yes, it totally needs to be available to everyone within the business. It should be no, it should be an inclusive product. We feel that all financial wellbeing tools should be. It should be available at any point. So the right moment. So that means at any time, because if there's ever a time of crisis, people need to have an option there open for them to actually fix that problem. If they want to educate themselves further, they should also have the, way, the ability to actually look and, and, and read through any articles they actually need. Independent financial guidance, like we are a financial, we're a technology business first that builds ethical financial products. So we actually feel the independent guidance that people get should come from the experts who focus in that space. It shouldn't increase employee debt in any form. Now, personally, I don't, I, I, I'm not, we're not saying debt is bad as an organization. We're just saying it's not the only answer. Like if people need a short, a short fund to deal with a problem, then they should have access obviously to their own ends because they've earned it to that point in time. That's the world that we believe in. And finally, it must promote good savings habits because that does help build that resilience piece that the people then can access that, those funds at any given point. Um, so look, firstly, like from myself, thank you guys everyone for listening. Um, I'll hand back to Georgie. I'm sure there's a load of questions. I think there's quite a few. Good stuff. Thank you so much, Rob, and to all of our speakers. Um, can I just ask you all now to come off video so we can see you all um, to go through some of the questions. So firstly, just a bit of a poll. What did everybody think? Please let us know. Completely anonymous. We don't take it personally. Um, great. So thank you so much for those of you who have submitted questions. So I'm just going to kick straight off in the interest of time. So firstly, we've got, um, this is probably a question for Eric. How do you know that you need to address financial wellness or build a financial wellness strategy in your organisation? Okay, yeah. Um, usually, you will start to see increased absenteeism. You may have, you know, interesting, Katie mentioned that they have an emergency loan um, option within Bupa um, or had in, in the old world. Um, increases to requests for emergency loans is an obvious one, right? Or people who are maybe using employee assistance programs more than they were. And hopefully your employee assistance program can give you some information off the back of that and what types of queries they're getting, you know, or are they referring people to step change for debt help or those types of things. So those are good places to start. Um, tagging on a couple of questions into your maybe annual employee surveys is always a good place um, if you're, you're thinking about those. Um, and then I guess just that, and, and this is actually the hard one right now, is that general chatter around the office, right? When you're talking to colleagues and you find out that, oh, they're really struggling with this or that. And that's probably really hard for all of us now because we're missing out on that, that, that opportunity to just keep our finger on the pulse of things working from home. Super. Could, I, could I just make some recommendations as well, if you if you don't mind, to, to echo Eric's points there. So if you if you're lucky enough to have an employee assistance program, it's some it you know they generally will categorize the calls that they're getting. So if they're um, you know stress management as a result of financial pressures, then looking at those statistics in the EAP office will help, and also listening to your payroll colleagues. You know, payroll colleagues will be getting phone calls of people saying, I can't buy my bus ticket this week, which is, is when you, you notice, you know, specific and acute cases, which are probably more widespread than you're, you're actually hearing on the, on the floor. Super. Katie, thank you. And Eric, thank you for that. Um, I've gotten one more question here as well for Katie. Um, someone said this looks like a great project, but how was this communicated or launched within the business effectively? Um, gosh, through a number of channels. So we had our internal cascade. Um, it was great that we felt we were delivering something that, again, was was landing, you know, in, in open arms. 
So the home managers were key for us getting those messages out there. We've got a few different communication channels within the, the, the care space as well internally. Um, and then there were some very tailored warm up communications that came directly from WageStream around getting enrolled um, in the run up to our launch. Since launch, we've had a couple of very pointed communications. Uh, WageStream um, very helpfully have helped us uh, deploy um, an, an emergency fund that we put in place when we went into lockdown originally in, in, in March and, and WageStream have helped us get that in, get that money into the hands of people that really need it. Um, but what we find is our, real, our best communication channel is people talking to colleagues on the floor. And saying, have you heard of, you know, did you think about, and um, you know, when somebody's saying, you know, it's, again to Eric's point, you know, those water cooler conversations or those staff room conversations where somebody's saying, oh, cracky, I've just got this bill in, our colleagues are recommending and wage stream enrolments to their colleagues as well to help them manage their finances. Super, thank you, Katie. Um, one more question. I'm conscious of time, so any that we haven't been able to answer, we will reach out to you. So, last question then. Um, We've got what is the best way a company can promote and execute a financial wellbeing program um, in their organization and who would be the best executive sponsor for this so katie i feel like you've probably already answered the first half of that but who do you feel would be like that champion or the best executive sponsor i think i think something in this space is is it's usually good to have a couple of sponsors it's great to have somebody that is close to the floor so if i if i reflect on our implementation we had sponsorship from um senior finance and from senior people but probably the most active and engaging was our senior operate operations director in care services because they you know they've got the vested interest of, of making this land so i think i don't think there's one executives you know one person that would really um serve the purpose i think you probably need a group of people that can really champion it along the business and down the different operational pillars great thank you we do have a few more questions we have had a request for eric our guru's top tips um as well in writing so eric will um, reach out to you and mar marry you up so we can get those questions answered um but thank you so much from from wage stream i'm just going to hand back had hand back to Tracy now from Generali who wants to do a sort of official wrap up and thank you. Thank you, Georgie. And thank you to all of our speakers. Thanks a lot for that. That was really useful. And um, I just wanted to, on a final note, say a couple of things. Uh, firstly, that uh, WageStream is one of our, to say again, that WageStream is one of our financial wellbeing investment matching partners, which means that we can help financially uh, contribute to the implementation of a new wage stream platform. And that's for our group income protection clients in the UK. Um, and also to mention that the, uh, the event was designed as part of a range of communications uh, and support for HR and line managers and employees. Um, and it's brought to employers in the shape of Generali UK's complimentary well-being communications calendar. So if you're looking for inspiration, you can use this calendar for webinars like today or other resources for line managers and employees. Uh, this calendar is published three times a year and it's available to download from our website. It, um, it's got lots of things coming up for Talk Money Week, for example, as mentioned at the start, plus Movember, Alcohol Awareness Week and Carers' Rights Day. Uh, the next iteration is coming up at the end of this year and it will cover the period 1 February to 31st of May 2021 and you can sign up to get uh, access to the uh, the new iterations uh, through the link that will accompany the webinar follow-up email and recording of this webinar so that's it from me enjoy the rest of your day it was lovely to see you all uh, the speakers and to see your questions and we'll look forward to seeing you again